So I didn't sleep at all last night, just letting you know. Um, you know, I woke up, uh, I woke up multiple times, but the, the last time, you know when you have those nights where you don't sleep and you keep waking up and then the last time you wake up, you're like, I'm not going back to sleep. Well, it was about, I, I rolled over, looked at my phone, it was about 5 a.m. And I thought to myself, I'm not going back to sleep, so what could I do right now? And my first thought, and you're like, man, this is super spiritual, Adam. And it actually is. Um, I thought, you know, I might just get up, take a shower, and just go to New City and, and, and pray for an hour and a half. You know, I planned on getting here at 8, so I can be there, you know, by 6, 6.30. And I'll do that. And then I realized I turned in my key on Thursday. <laughs> so I'm glad that the carnal side of me was like, you know what, let's not pray this morning. Let's just... <laughs> Let's try to get some sleep, and because if I would have shown up um, and didn't have a key, my carnal self would have really been showing. Um, but all that to say, I, I, I honestly couldn't sleep because as I thought about today, it's a day that me and Emily, my wife, have thought about for, for many years. Um, and as I thought about this morning, I did not think about sending Sunday for, for our benefit, for Adam's benefit, for Emily's benefit, for citizens' benefit. But rather, I thought of a church that has loved us, that literally, as I think back to my ministry, was started at a church here, <laughs> in a townhome. My wife didn't even want a church plan at that point. We've come a long way. And all my mind is on is that, hey, some church planters don't have the experience that I have. In fact, I've met guys who have told me on the phone and told me to my face, you have no idea how lucky you are to have a church that is sending you, to have a pastor that gives you opportunities, to have people that believe in you, and to be able to witness God build his church for the last four years that we've been here. And so normally we start off with a story because studies say that if I don't grab your attention within 30 seconds, you won't listen to anything I have to say. But rather than a story, I just want to say thank you. Because we've said this many times, and we'll say it again. We are not planting Citizens Church without your help, your money, your commitment to us and to bringing the gospel to Kernersville, North Carolina. So thank you. And if studies show true, and I don't have your attention after not telling a story, it's my last time, so you know what, let's just go with it. <laughs> We're going to be in Exodus today. We've, we're going to continue our study through the book of Exodus. And today I'm going to leave you with a, a comforting, encouraging, joyful message. And we're going to be looking at the first six plagues. Um, <laughs> as God would have it, plagues are moving in. Adam is moving out, right? Amen. That's what we're doing here this morning. <laughs> we're going to be in Exodus chapter 7. And we're going to be covering a lot of ground in Scripture. Not reading every verse, but we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 7 starting in verse 14 all the way to Exodus chapter 9, ending in verse 12. And so we're going to look at these, these plagues. And like I said, we may not read every verse, but what I hope to do this morning is as we read these plagues and read what is taking place in Egypt, that we would be able to pull out reminders and maybe convictions from the Lord this morning in his word. That as the Lord our God in heaven reveals himself, that we would pay close attention to what he's doing, not just in the book of Exodus, not just in Egypt, not just through these plagues, but how he is looking to reveal himself to you and to me through the perfect word of God. And so where we've been, Moses and Aaron are commanded to go to Pharaoh. He's the top dog in Egypt. And essentially it says this, hey, you know it, let my people go, right? Let my people go. The Lord says, I am with you, Moses. I am with you, Aaron. Go to Pharaoh and command that he let my people go. Well, Pharaoh, not the nicest guy, doesn't say, okay, sounds good. Do you need anything for your trip? Rather, the scriptures tell us, and we saw last week, that Pharaoh's heart was hardened, that he would not let the people go. And then we pick up our story here, and, and the Lord is saying a few things to Moses, and we're going to see a repetition here of plagues coming of the Lord going to Moses and saying something like this, go to Pharaoh, go to Pharaoh, go to Pharaoh. And so we'll pick it up in Exodus chapter 7, verse 14. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. When you see him walking out by the water, stand ready to meet him by the bank of the Nile. Take in your hand the staff that turned into a snake. We saw that last week. Tell him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, he has sent me to tell you, let my people go, so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But so far, you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. Here is how you will know that I am the Lord. Watch. I am about to strike the water in the Nile with the staff in my hand, and it will turn to blood. The fish in the Nile, they'll die. The river will stink, and the Egyptians will be unable to drink the water from it. So the first plague that we see here, and I don't think it's coincidence that God starts it this way, we see that the river, the Nile, is going to be turned to blood. Now the river, uh, the, the Nile, has, has played a significant part in our story thus far. In the beginning of Exodus, we see that Moses was placed in this river. After Pharaoh, this evil man, put out this law that if any Israelite boy is born, throw him in the river. Genocide is taking place in the land. And then we see Moses' mother put him in a reed basket and put him in this dangerous river, not babbling brook. This dangerous river. This river is vast. It puts out hundreds of thousands of gallons of water every minute. And God starts here with the plagues. And what does he say? Go to Pharaoh while he's walking by this river. Stand ready. When Pharaoh goes out in the morning to the Nile, go meet him there. And it's interesting because if you read this passage and you're like me, you might think, well, Pharaoh is Pharaoh. He's top dog. Why is he going to the Nile? Doesn't he have servants for water if that's why he needed to go? Like, like why is he going? He has his palace. He has servants. His servants have servants. So why is he there? Well, historians have thrown out a few theories and it's, it's pretty, the, the, the first one is like, well, that could happen. But the second one is my favorite theory. So the first theory is this. Why was Pharaoh at the Nile? Well, you see, for tax purposes, every morning someone had to measure the height of the Nile. To be fair, to levy the taxes, you would have to measure the Nile. And so because this river was such an important aspect in their, of their culture, it could have been that Pharaoh himself was going to measure this to make sure that the measurements were right. That's the first theory. The second theory, I could equate to like a new relationship, if you will, okay? What's true in every new relationship about the two people? Just shout it out. You know what? This is my last Sunday. Shout it out. What's new? Or what's true? I'm sorry. They're enamored. And with enamorment, you know what you don't do? You don't poop. <laughs> no one shouted that out. In a new relationship, you're enamored. And you know what's true? Neither one of you poops. No, I've been washing my hands for 30 minutes, babe. What are you talking about? What does this have to do with Exodus? The second theory I have claimed as the bathroom theory. You see, as Pharaoh, Pharaoh was God. And if there's one thing about gods, they do not defile themselves by excrements. So was Pharaoh going to the river early in the morning before anyone was there so that no one would see him defile himself. And if this is true, the comedy of our God to say, hey, <laughs> we're going to meet this man with his pants down. <laughs> Go to Pharaoh in the morning. Go to him in the morning, thus says the Lord. And so Moses, he goes. Now, that's not proven or anything. That's just what I think, okay? <laughs> but he goes to Pharaoh, Moses does, and he says, hey, this is what is about to happen. And in verse 17, the Lord says, this is what the Lord says. Here is how you know that I am the Lord. And then he talks about the plagues. And so before we go any further, we have to remind ourselves of what Pharaoh's question was in Exodus chapter 5. Like, why are the plagues even happening? Why is the Lord doing this? Well, do you remember, and it'll be on the screen, in Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, this is what Pharaoh says. But Pharaoh answered. He responded to Moses and Aaron. 
Who is the Lord that I should obey him? By letting Israel go? <laughs> I don't know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Who is the Lord? Now, this is not a sweet question trying to get to know Yahweh a little bit better. In pride and godlike status, Pharaoh knows and believes that no one is above him, and especially not the God of the lowly Hebrews. So in complete transparency, our Lord is going to answer this question. And throughout the book of Exodus, and especially this morning today, we will time and time again repeat this question. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? As we walk through the plagues, we're going to see that the plagues are coming in twos. We're going to begin with the Nile and frogs. We're going to get to gnats and flies. And then we'll end today with the death of livestock and boils. And so if we'll look back down at the text, we'll start again in verse 19. So the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, canals, ponds, all their water reservoirs. They will become blood. There will be blood throughout the land of Egypt, even in wooden and stone containers. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and his officials, he raised his staff and struck the Nile. And all the water in the Nile was turned to blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink from it. There was blood throughout the land. But the magicians of Egypt, we met them last week, did the same thing by their occult practices. So Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Then Pharaoh turned around, went to his palace, and didn't even take this to heart. All the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink because they could not drink the water from the river. Seven days passed after the Lord struck the Nile. So all the waters in Egypt are now blood. All the fish, they are dead, and the water is not drinkable. And at this point, as readers of this text, we think, well, this is obviously the workings of the Lord. The Lord is over the Nile. The Lord is over creation. The entire Nile just turned to blood. But this text tells us sadly that Pharaoh's heart was still hard and that his pride is on full display. And did you catch the level of his pride? Look again at verse 24. All the water is blood. And this is what they do. They dug puddles. All the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink because they could not drink the water from the river. Instead of having this vast river where they got their drinking water every day, as they watched this river turn to blood, instead of recognizing the God of the Israelites, they settle for dirty pools of muddy water. Pharaoh, the God in Egypt, just digs a moat around himself. And as we read this text, my heart is reminded of this point, that we can easily settle in our relationship with the Lord. We can easily settle in our relationship with the Lord. I can do this. You know, I'm reminded of, uh, you know, settling is never something that we command, right? <laughs> like, there's never a time where we're like, oh, we settled for this, and everybody's like, oh, that's a good decision. Good. And I can think back to school, both in my... Uh, my undergrad and then even um, my master's degree, I would have certain professors that would start the first day of class like this. And maybe, you know, if you're still in school, maybe you're familiar with this, and if you're still young enough to remember school, you'll probably remember this too. Oh, oh no, no, okay, that didn't go over well. But the professor says something like this. If you do not read these textbooks and you do not study, you will not receive a good grade in this class. To which I respond, great, so what do I have to do to get an okay grade? <laughs> As my time in school went on, I found myself settling more and more. Who cares about an A? Get me a C, and did I get a that's right? <laughs> amen, that's, <laughs> amen, that's right. <laughs> Never settle, Sherrod. <laughs> and as we find ourselves doing these things, settling never gets easier. 
I never found myself settling in school, and then all of a sudden, you know, the last week of classes, I just, let's, let's get it, let's get it going. I'm going to study really, really hard. And we settle in these things. And that's a silly example, but think about your life. Do we settle for church attendance over community? You know, maybe you've sat in these chairs and, and someone on this stage has said, hey, go to the lobby and sign up for a community group. And our hearts are tempted to think, I don't have time for that. But I'm here every Sunday. Do we settle for being safe over being known? Every service at New City Church, we take a time and confess. We confess our sins to God. And I pray that you're confessing your sins to one another. But in that moment, our hearts will be tempted to think, it's easier just being safe. I don't want to be known. Do we settle for rituals over relationships? We pray over every, every meal, but our prayer life is an inch deep. I'm reminded that in all three areas, this is where my heart is tempted to settle. Not just in the everyday things of school, but in my everyday walk with the Lord. Pharaoh settled. The entire Nile is blood, and he says, eh, I've got some muddy water right here. Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? We pick it back up in chapter 8, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, go in to Pharaoh and tell him. This is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. But if you refuse to let them go, then I will plague all of your territory with frogs. The Nile will swarm with frogs. They will come up. They will go into your palace, into your bedroom, on your bed, into your houses, on your officials, on your people, into your ovens, in your kneading bowls. The frogs will come up on you, your people, and all your officials. Guys, frogs are everywhere. And I got to be honest, a river of blood would freak me out. But frogs, they terrify me. <laughs> there is something about, I can kill spiders, any, any sort of bug. I can, for the most part, smash it with a shoe and be fine. But frogs are tricky because frogs just sit there until they're ready to move. And they never move at the right time. Frogs are terrifying, y'all. And God is so detailed that he's saying, look, frogs are not just coming from the Nile. They're going to be in your oven. They're going to be in your bowls. They're going to be on your servants. They're going to be in your bed. Check your pillow. They're there. Hide your kids and your wives because frogs <laughs> are coming. Frogs are everywhere. And this gets Pharaoh's attention. The magicians do the same thing if we were to keep reading. And Pharaoh sees that frogs are everywhere. And he goes to Moses and he pleads with Moses, make this stop. And Moses, being the respectful man that he is, says, hey, your honor, you just tell me when, and I'll pray to the Lord, and it'll stop. Pharaoh, smart man he is, tomorrow. Now, I don't know why Pharaoh didn't say stop it right now, but Pharaoh said, let's, let's stop it tomorrow. So Moses says, okay. So God stops the frogs, and then look at verse 15 in chapter 8. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them, as the Lord says. Frogs are everywhere. The magicians of Egypt, they do the same thing. And Pharaoh, the Lord has his attention. Pharaoh pleads for it to stop, and it does. And then Pharaoh oversees the land. He sees the heaps of dead frogs. And instead of recognizing the God of the lowly Hebrews, he saw that there was relief and hardened his heart once again. And the encouragement and the reminder, maybe the conviction that we see in this passage right here is that God can certainly have our attention, but he might not have our heart. God can have our attention, but not our heart. Did Pharaoh, did the Lord have Pharaoh's attention? Oh, yeah. But did he have his heart? Nah. And is this not us sometimes? What are you walking through right now in your life where God might just be 
going after your heart. Not just your attention, but your heart. Work is tough right now. God could be saying, don't chase the money, chase me. You've been faithful in singleness, just can't find the right one. God could be saying, your heart belongs to me, chase me. It is possible for God to have your attention, but not your heart. And I'll take it one step further. Your football team could be the one in Washington, and they stink. And God is saying, don't give your heart to them. Give it to me. In goodness, the Lord chases our heart down time and time again. And giving him our attention is one thing. The Lord has our attention in this, in this place. But the Lord in his goodness is after so much more than your attention. Give him your heart. You know, as I think about planting Citizens Church, um, the great temptation almost every week, especially as we move along in this journey, is to think when a church partners with me financially, when people join the team, when we have someone as talented as Travis who would drive from the Triad area at 515 this morning, I'm tempted to build my platform. I'm very tempted to think, man, what could God do if he brings a lot of people that could hear me? What could God do if he gives us a building that can hold a lot of people and the people that come could give a lot of money? Man, that would get my attention. And it's in these moments that the Lord reminds me in passages just like this, it's not about my platform. It's about your heart. And it's about the heart of the people who are in the triad. We will be tempted to settle. We will be tempted to just give our attention when the Lord is saying, I want more than that. And Pharaoh, in this moment, you know it. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? Pick it up back in uh, verse 16 seen gnats now. Okay, so we've moved away. We're getting to gnats, smaller, smaller little pesty creatures. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the land. It will become like gnats throughout the land of Egypt. And they did this. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff, and when he struck the dust of the land, gnats were on the people and the animals. All the dust of the land became gnats throughout the land of Egypt. The magicians tried to produce gnats using their occult practices, but they could not. The gnats remained on the people and the animals. And here's what the magicians say. This is the finger of God, the magician said to Pharaoh. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen to them as the Lord says. And then we hit verse 20. The Lord said to Moses, so this is after the gnats, get up early in the morning, present yourself to Pharaoh when you see him going out to the waters. Pants are down once again. Tell him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may, they may worship me. But if you will not let my people go, then I will send swarms of flies against you, your officials, your people, and your houses. The Egyptians' houses will swarm with flies, and so will the land where they live. But on that day, I will give special treatment to the land of Goshen, where my people are living. No flies will be there. This way you will know that I, the Lord, am in the land. I will, be make, I will make a distinction between my people and your people and this sign will take place tomorrow. So now we're at the third and fourth plagues. And we notice that there is something a bit different about these plagues than the previous ones. Number one, the magicians cannot reproduce the gnats and the flies. This is different than the other plagues. This is different than last week when we looked at the serpents on the ground. They can't do it. And in fact, they confess to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And the second thing that is different about these plagues we notice is that the flies do not attack the Israelites. In this plague, God makes a distinction between the Egyptians and his people. Because think about this. Who has been suffering right alongside the Egyptians? The Israelites. It's not that the Israelites were able to find non-bloody water. God said that frogs would be all over your servants. Who are the servants to the Egyptians? 
the Israelites. Moses and Aaron are in the thick of this. But this time the Lord says, I will not put flies on them, and I will make the distinction between people. And now think about all the Egyptian art that you've ever seen, maybe in a textbook, maybe in a movie, in a museum. You see the Egyptians, and they're normally doing what? Reclining, right? Think about Pharaoh. If you were to paint Pharaoh, you'd probably paint this couch, and Pharaoh would be reclining on it, probably someone feeding him grapes and fanning him, right? Well, how comfortable can you be with gnats and flies all over you? I mean, think about this. Try to not even stretch out on a couch, but try to have a nice cookout on your back deck. And mosquitoes are everywhere, right? Gnats are everywhere. It's awful, isn't it? And in this moment, God is totally coming after their comfort. He is completely attacking their comfort. But what does the Bible say about comfort? And this is the God that we serve, and I find this so interesting. You see, time and time again throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see this reminder and this conviction from the Lord that you were never meant to live a comfortable life for the sake of the gospel. We are to do whatever it takes for the gospel to reach every nation, every tongue, every tribe, every people. That's probably not a comfortable life for many people. But what does the Bible also say? Time and time again, the Bible reminds us that who is God close to? Those who are not comfortable. The brokenhearted are the ones who find relief. The ones who are sick, the ones who are sad, the ones who are upset, the ones who are experiencing job loss because of COVID, the one who is going through marriage struggles. Who is the one that finds comfort in the Lord? Those people. But in this moment, God is coming against this top dog Pharaoh and his comfort. He sends the gnats and he sends the flies. And in this response, we won't read it, but Pharaoh says something like this. Okay, go worship, but stay here. Stay in the city and worship. You see, the command of God was to go somewhere and worship. But Pharaoh says, stay here. Moses responds with, look, man, we can't stay here. If we stay here and worship our God, we will be killed by the Egyptians. So that's a good reason. But here's another reason. It also comes down to the fact that there is no bargaining with the Lord. Why couldn't the Israelites stay in the city? Because they would be killed. But more than anything, why could they not stay in the city? Because the Lord said, go. The Lord said, go, and there is no bargaining with the Lord. There's an election coming up. And many people, myself included, will be tempted to bargain our love for people based on who they vote for. We will be tempted to say, Lord, I know you command me to love God and love others. Mm, but they voted for him. We will be tempted to bargain. And we try to find this excuse why we should not love people. And God says, that's not what I commanded. And here as Pharaoh tries to bargain with the Lord, it's just comical because it's like, dude, you can't bargain with him. He's literally sending gnats and flies on you right now. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, the scripture would tell us. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? And now we close this morning looking at a few verses in chapter 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. But if you refuse to let them go and keep holding them, then the Lord's hand will bring a severe plague against your livestock in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the livestock, and the, the flocks. And then jump to verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of furnace soot, and Moses is to throw it towards heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over the entire land of Egypt. It will become festering boils on the people and the animals throughout the land of Egypt. So they took the furnace soot and they stood before Pharaoh. Moses threw it toward heaven and it became festering boils on the people and animals. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as all of the Egyptians. We have now reached physical death when it comes to plagues. 
We see the physicality of these plagues in the death of the livestock. All the Egyptians, camels, their herds, their flocks, everything is dead. And then we see festering boils that attack the people. Now, it's not in Scripture, but it's pretty well known that furnace soot is much finer than just regular dust particles. And so as Moses throws this up into the air towards heaven, it says this fine dust covers the land. Well, you see, it's not just attacking their bodies like anthrax, but it's also much finer and can get into the lungs. So here within this plague, we see the first attack on the physicality of the Egyptians. That not only do you not have water, not only do you have no comfort and frogs are everywhere, but now it's getting physical. And after all this, you would probably think, Pharaoh would come to the conclusion, Lord, spare me, I'm done. But look at verse 12. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord had told Moses. Now, there's a subtle difference here. All the other plagues have said that Pharaoh hardened his heart. But within this verse, it says that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. What do we do with this? Well, next week, Dylan will be talking about that, so you should come back to New City next week. No, I'm just kidding. He might be, I don't know. <laughs> what do we do with this? How did the Lord do this? Well, he simply revealed himself. You see, within the first five plagues, the revelation of Yahweh, the Lord, was in full effect in front of Pharaoh. And time and time again, he said, he, he raised this question, who is the Lord? In his pride, in his arrogance, he responds with pride. God revealed himself time and time again, and it was this revelation that Pharaoh rejected. The blame here is not on the Lord. Do not get tripped up in verse 12 and think, how could the Lord do this? Pharaoh is at fault. And the Lord is good. So what do we do with this? In closing, I'd like to draw our attention to Matthew 16. It'll be up on the screen. What do we do with this revelation that Pharaoh has rejected? His heart is hardened. I'm reminded of this story in the book of Matthew, and it says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others, Elijah, still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then look at verse 15. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Who is the Lord? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not catch this reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. See, here, Jesus flips this question around on the disciples. We've been asking the question all morning, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And here, in our Savior, in our Messiah, Jesus simply poses the question to his followers, who is the Lord? Who do you say that I am? And I believe in this question, we find ourselves with, with two viable options. Every day, you and I have a choice. And every day, we can answer this question, who is the Lord, shake our fist in the air, and say, who is the Lord that I should obey him? My sexuality is what it is. My job is what it is. Let me be my autonomous being. You have no idea what I'm going through. And if God is out there, he certainly is not good. Who is the Lord? Or we can humbly confess each and every morning that I know who the Lord is. That he is our Messiah and he is the son 
of the living God. Now, before you get confused, and maybe you think, well, Adam, are you saying that it's not okay to seek and it's not okay to ask questions? You see, the problem was not as much in Pharaoh's question as it was Pharaoh's heart. If you are sitting here today and you're asking, who is the Lord? God can handle it. God does not turn that away. It's a prideful heart that the Lord despises. It's not the heart that seeks. It's not the heart that doubts. It's not the heart that questions. It's the prideful heart that rejects his revelation. You and I have a choice. And it is okay to question the Lord and to seek him in our questioning. Why? And this is our bottom line for today. Because who is the Lord? The Lord is the one who reveals himself to anyone who seeks him. Why do we plant churches? Because we believe that there is a God in heaven who is revealing himself. What did Jesus say to Peter? I will build my church and the gates of hell won't stop it. That's why we church plant. Us going out today, planting Citizens Church, is direct testimony of what Jesus said in Matthew 16. We are living in the gates of hell will not stop it. The Lord is the one who reveals himself to anyone who seeks him. He's not a puzzle. He's not a riddle. He has revealed himself in the plagues, and he has revealed himself in the sending of Jesus. The gospel is the good news, and I'll leave you with this. Rivers of blood, frogs, gnats, and flies, that's child's play. In the hands of our gods, he is over all that. That's child's play in comparison to the revelation that you and I have the chance of seeing and grasping and holding on to and treasuring, and that is the revelation of Christ in the sending of Jesus. On the cross, we see the slain lamb. We see the Son of God crucified for you and for me. And in his resurrection, we see the revelation of all the glory of God bestowed in the person of God as he resurrected over death and sin. The plagues? Oh, that's child's play. But the fact that God takes care of your sins because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. That is the good news of the gospel. That is something to marvel at. And if we will continue to ask our questions, if we will continue to seek him, he is the God that has promised to reveal himself to anyone who would seek him. And so let's pray. And as we pray um, and the band comes up, I, I want you to believe in the song that we're about to sing. That we believe that we will see God's goodness in the land of the living. That if we keep seeking, we keep pursuing, and we humbly come before our God, he's going to reveal himself because that's what he does. The Lord is the one who reveals himself to all who seek him. Jesus, you are good.